Uh, may I ask anyone to join to switch off them of the mics and the video? It will assist us when we start proceedings. Mr. Mulder, welcome. Hi, Andre, can you hear me? Jody, hi, I can hear you clearly. Sorry, I was just doing a sound check. My one laptop is bombed and the other one is about to die. So I'm frantic here. Thank you. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm fine yourself. Good, man. Good. Just yeah. tired. And this coronavirus is really getting to a person, eh? On a yeah. personal level. Yeah, I think to all of us. <laughs> yeah. Thanks no, okay, great. Let me, let me mute yeah. myself. No problem. Thanks. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You can hear me. I can hear you clearly. Yes, yeah. yeah, uh, Edward, NRCS. Oh, Edward, no, I, I see you, Edward. 
I've noticed yeah, you. I'm just checking. I'm just no, checking the sound. We can hear you clearly. Okay, thank you. No problem. Good afternoon, Andre. Good afternoon. I'm speaking to. Hi, it's Tandy from DTI. Can you hear me? I can hear you clearly, Tandy. You're fine. Okay. All Thanks. right. I was just checking. All right. Thanks. No problem. Mr. Mbuyani, your mic is off. <laughs> How are you? How are you, Mr. I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine yourself. No, no yeah. I'm well. That's good. How's, That's good. It, how's the thing in the USA? You know perfect. this technology. No, You're perfect. 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 No, okay. <laughs> all right. No, yeah. thank you. Okay. Hi. Hi, Andre. Of the chamber is getting worried. <laughs> <laughs> it's a house cures. You see, I had to wash the cups. Okay. Before I come here. You had no choice. <laughs> I was drinking a lot of coffee. Okay. <laughs> no fine. They, they don't. They don't like the kitchen dirty. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I see we 28 connected. Yes, Chair, we are connected 28. We are six members currently connected, Chair. Um, okay. So we can proceed at, 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 at three o'clock if we need to, Chair. No, we can proceed at three o'clock, Chair. But I will, I will keep track of, of members joining. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Andre? Andre? Can hear you? Have you received uh, Honorable Mantashi's uh, apology? No, I have not. I'll check my emails now. I haven't received it. 
sent me a, a, a WhatsApp. Can I forward that to you? Will it serve as an apology? Yeah, I can. Yeah, Just forward it to me okay. so I have a record of it. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. No problem. Chair, we have one minute before we start proceedings, Chair. I'm sure we can start. Yes, we can, Chair. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, uh, Andre and the admin staff. And to honorable members as well, good afternoon. And I'm sure that we can be able to actually then uh, maybe do the roll call, uh, Andre. Yes, Chair. I'll call the names of members and they can then verify the attendance. Mrs. Hermans. Present. Thank you. Ms. Mutahum. Mutahum. Present. Thank Ms. you. Ms. Muatse. Muatse. Present. Thank you. Ms. McPherson. Yeah, I'm here. Thank Mr. You. Mulder. I'm present. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Mr. Mbuyani. Mbuyani. Present. Thank you. Chair, then yes. we have three apologies, Chair. Yes. From Mr. Cudworth, who is on paternity leave. Yes. Mr. Fring, who is attending the Public Works Committee meeting, Chair, because he's serving on many committees. Yes. And then Ms. Mantashe, who is not feeling well. She's currently at the doctor, Chair. Yes. Can I then just check with the members? Because I'm sure in terms of today's program, if you can put it up. But for apologies, can I actually then check uh, that we accept the apologies? Unless maybe there's any other comment from members. We'll accept the apologies of members. And uh, I think um, we will actually then look at the adoption of the agenda. And um, the two items presentation by the DTI and technical infrastructure institutions and uh, the contribu their contribution to COVID-19 pandemic. There's going to be actually the uh, questions, uh, comments um, session after the presentation. And then we're going to be actually looking at the next uh, part, which is formal consideration of the budget vote. Uh, which we agreed to. I'm sure we can actually take comments on that. And then I think that's the end of the agenda as proposed before the committee. Uh, honorable members, here's the agenda. Uh, yes. Chairperson? Okay. Yes. Moatse? Yes, Honorable Moatse. I move for adoption of the agenda. Thank you very much. Mr. Uh, Mubayani, Chair, raise his hand. Mr. Mubayani. Honorable Mboyani. Chairperson, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to uh, to second the proposal to adopt the agenda. Thank you very much. Yo, your image looks better today, and I can hear you properly. I hope it goes no. out there through, throughout the meeting. <laughs> so the yes. second text, can I check if ever there's any objection, honorable members? And uh, if not, uh, I would ask that uh, we actually then proceed having actually adopted the agenda to take the first presentation, uh, which we actually just agreed to. Uh, Honorable uh, uh, members, I'm sure the Secretary will actually um, Chair? pick up on that. Uh, Andre? Chair, if I may, the, the DTIC will, will start the, with a brief overview, then they will follow by each, each technical infrastructure institutions. So it will follow in the order of the presentation, Chair. 
And then okay. after we will then have the engagement. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, can we then agree in that order, honorable members? I'm sure we actually have those presentation uh, tations actually circulated. Can we actually invite uh, the DTIC? I'm not sure who would be actually Chair. leading the team. Chair? Yes. Chair, may, may I just add, uh, um, request that whoever is starting the presentation should introduce themselves, and as they go along, they should do that also, Chair. Okay, can I invite the uh, official of the DTIC to introduce uh, himself or herself and maybe the entities, those who will be presenting. Can I then invite the DTIC to talk to us? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members. Um, it's uh, Ms. Tandi Pele. Uh, apologies if I switch off my switch on my video, my connection gets really bad. Um, if it's allowed by the committee, can I continue with my video off? Uh, if it's acceptable? We would, we would really love to hear your voice. The image, uh, we, we may feel bad, but it's okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, thank, th th thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, as I've already indicated, I'm Tandi Pele. I'm the acting Deputy Director General of the Industrial Competitiveness and Growth uh, Division, um, formerly known as the Industrial Development Division, IDD. I'm here with my colleague, Dr. De Chenge Dimani, who is the Chief Director responsible for technical infrastructure work in the department. Um, we are here with our four entities, uh, the Bureau, South African Bureau of Standards, led by Ms. Jody Scott, who is the lead administrator. Um, uh, we are also here with uh, National Regulator for Compulsory Specification, uh, which is uh, led by uh, Edward Mamadise, the CEO. Um, and we are joined again by the South African National Accreditation System, um, uh, led by uh, the CEO, Ron Mr. Dr. Ron, uh, and also uh, um, uh, the CEO of, of NIMISA, um, Ms. Sandra Kulu. Um, Chair, uh, we will run through uh, a, very, a bit of a lengthy presentation, um, uh, but this presentation is going to be shared between all of us, given the integrated nature of the technical infrastructure work. Uh, we will try by all means to be as, uh, as, 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 as quickly as possible, but not losing the key points that we would like to put forward to the committee. Uh, Chenge Dimani will be running through the presentation. Chenge, can you put, please put yeah. the presentation on the screen? Maybe the other, point, the other point which may make things easier, DDG, is to say that at least this, the presentation was circulated in good time. Members have actually read through them as well. And I'm sure your, your approach is quite acceptable. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, Chenge, uh, are you able to put the presentation through? Uh, Secretary, can you please confirm if uh, uh, the, mem the members are, uh, the presentation is visible on the screen? It is visible on the screen. Members can see it on the screen. Yes. Thank you. Okay. All right. Th 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 thanks, you. Th thanks, Secretary. Um, I think I will do just a quick overview of uh, our presentation and our approach to this presentation. Uh, first, locating the work of the technical infrastructure within the broader industrial policy of the Department of the Nation. Um, um, as the committee would know, we launched what we call the Reimagine Industrial Strategy at the beginning of the sixth administration. Uh, which uh, is aimed at deepening industrial development, uh, preserve and create decent jobs, uh, and achieve structural transformation and reforms in the economy. Uh, the department uh, is implementing the strategy through a focused approach on developing high impact programs uh, as set out in the different uh, sectoral master plan. But for today's discussion, uh, we are here to, to give a, a view of the work that we have uh, been engaged with as technical infrastructure institutions to contribute to measures to combat uh, against uh, COVID-19. Uh, as the committee members are now uh, fairly, uh, fairly affected to the issues to the, the virus, that the outbreak is having massive impact on the global health system, uh, huge disruption on uh, supply chains, economic growth. Um, in South Africa, this shock is being felt through all the productive sectors. Um, it's posing significant risks to industrial capacity and jobs. However, the pandemic, the pandemic itself had also created opportunities that are currently being uh, pursued to support the health system through the development and uh, enhancement of industrial capabilities and local production. 
uh, because technical infrastructure or standard based uh, uh, instruments are one of the key instruments or what we call a toolbox of our industrial policy uh, interventions. We are locating this work very much into our approach to sector work and how we should be utilizing these instruments to ensure that uh, we enhance uh, um, uh, our development work and, and, and development of the various sectors. Um, Technical infrastructure, uh, uh, as uh, we are all aware, is a system of setting standards and demonstrating that such standards are complied to in order to build confidence uh, in the economy. Uh, the system itself is comprised of four uh, entities, as I've already indicated, SAPS, uh, NRCS, um, SANAS, and MIMISA. Uh, the work of the four institutions is complemented by the work done also by the private sector bodies. Uh, in ensuring that products and industrial processes um, that we are producing and, and, and implementing in the domestic economy um, uh, meet uh, the required specification for safety and performance. Um, further, uh, further to that uh, is to ensure that uh, this work uh, is done in a manner that it, it, it improves uh, the, the, the products and services uh, that are, are being sold in the domestic economy and also protects uh, uh, citizens and employees from unsafe uh, uh, products and, and environment. Um, so the, the four institutions will take us through uh, what, has, what work have they been doing to contribute to the efforts uh, by national government um, to combating the COVID-19 um, uh, virus. Uh, but before we get into the institutions themselves, uh, my colleague, Dr. Timan, will just take us through a brief overview of the mandate of the four institutions and the role that they play so that we are locate, we locate the work that they have done uh, in the COVID uh, space uh, within the, the, their different roles. Uh, Dr. Dumani? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tandi. Good afternoon, Chairperson. Uh, afternoon. Good, afternoon, honor good afternoon, honorable members. Uh, yeah, mine is just a short input. Uh, as we are, we all know, uh, the, starting with the SABS in terms of mandate, uh, the SABS was founded by uh, the Standard Act uh, of 2008. Um, it was established as the peak national institu institution to develop standards, perform conformity assessment services, and promote quality. Uh, so this, the role of the SABS is to develop, maintain, and promote South African national standards. The SABS, as you know, also provides third-party commercial testing and services uh, for a specific range of products in accordance with the standards that they develop. Uh, I think we all know that the SABS has been around for, since the 1940s, uh, and uh, it's only the act that has changed over the years. What happened? Sorry, I, I must have pressed something wrong. Um, okay. okay, so moving forward, uh, the, the next mandate is the mandate of the NRCS. Uh, the NRCS uh, was founded through the National Regulator for Compulsory Specifications Act. Uh, we also know that uh, the NRCS uh, actually um, administers three acts. There is the Legal Metrology Act that uh, is there to ensure that there is enforcement and protection uh, against a short measure. Uh, and then the, N the NRCS also has the National Building Regulation and Building Standards Act that they administer. The purpose of this act is to promote uniformity in the law relating to the erection of building and is for prescribing that uh, uh, building plans uh, are actually approved by local authorities. Uh, so in short, the role of the NRCS is to develop compulsory specifications and to ensure that those compulsory specifications are actually enforced. And this uh, is for specific products uh, that have been um, identified. And these products are found in the chemicals, materials and mechanical space, in the electrotechnical space, in foods and also in the automotive industry. Uh, the next uh, entity that is here with us today is SANAS. SANAS was established by the Accreditation for Conformity, uh, Assessment, Calibration and Good Laboratory Practice Act. Uh, 
as the only uh, national accreditation body in South Africa. So the role of SANA is to, is to create an impartial and transparent mechanism for organizations to independently demonstrate that they are competent to do the work uh, that they, uh, they claim they do. So in, in essence, uh, the role of SANAS is to ensure that uh, uh, the bodies that perform testing, inspection and certification are competent. So SANAS is all about competence. Uh, the next body is the National Metrology Institute of South Africa, NEMISA for short. NEMISA was established by the Measurements Units and Measurement Standards Act of 2006, uh, NEMISA is there to provide for the use of measurement units of the international system of units and to designate other measurement units for use. Uh, so the role of NEMISA is to ensure that measurements performed uh, nationally in science, in industry, or for legal purposes are accurate and are actually internationally acceptable. Uh, so in other words, NEMISA is there to make sure that uh, standard certification and inspection actually give us the, the right answers. So NEMISA is there for the right answer. OK, so uh, before the entities come through, uh, let, let me just uh, state that uh, following the declaration of the national state of uh, disaster in March, the technical infrastructure entities needed to continue uh, as they provide essential services. They continue to ensure that the products sold in the domestic market meet the minimum quality and safety requirements. As you know, the pandemic has resulted in much higher demand for personal protective equipment, uh, such as face masks, protective clothing, goggles, gloves, uh, disinfectants, and even hand sanitizers. Uh, these products are essential to ensure the safety and to protect the health of frontline medical workers and uh, the general citizenry. The quality and performance of uh, uh, PP products and other products such as foodstuffs and other essential services products is actually defined by relevant standards and technical regulations here in this country and at the international level. And this just underlines the importance of the technical infrastructure uh, entities. So today, the leadership of the entities will discuss in detail how they have been working uh, to contribute to government's uh, fight uh, against COVID-19 and how they have ensured that the system, the technical infrastructure system, is safeguarded uh, to, to, be, to continue to be of use in the economy, uh, and how they have ensured that the quality of products that I've mentioned, including PPE, uh, it's, um, it's a, at the requirement level. Um, okay, so, what we'll do now, uh, we'll ask the different entities uh, to go through their, their contributions, uh, starting with the, the SABS. Uh, good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon, honorable members. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, pre to present what the Bureau of Standards has been doing. Uh, Chair, I think um, just something I'd like to make an announcement the, um, that's just come in um, from the Department of Women, Youth and Persons with Disabilities. They've mm -hmm. um, been working, they've been guiding a, a process to develop washable, reusable sanitary towels. And sa the Department, um, uh, SABS has actually put out a standard in this regard. It SANS, the South African National Standards 1812. This is a first for Southern Africa Chair and Honourable Members, um, and it's actually putting South Africa as a leader in the menstrual health and hygiene sector. Um, it's it's longer lasting, it's more durable, and I think it, it provides many women and children in South Africa with a dignity um, that is so often difficult to achieve during this uh, time in their, in their life cycles. So Chair, I think it's been um, 
a good piece of work that we've partnered with the Department of Women, Youth and, and, and People with, with Disabilities. They've guided the process through the sanitary um, dignity uh, implementation framework and have um, been working with us um, over the past two years to develop this standard. So we're pleased to make that announcement, Chair. Uh, Chair, then I think the work that we've been doing is essentially in, in two parts. The one is looking at um, our support to Business for South Africa to support essential services during um, lockdown levels uh, five and lockdown levels four. And then also looking at how do we safeguard the health of everybody who comes to the SABS campus. We've got um, all of our employees, we've got a number of tenants, the customers that are coming onto the campus um, to drop off uh, samples by prior arrangement and suppliers. Um, Chair, so we've had a, a small staff uh, complement um, who have continued working um, at the labs. We've, um, and I'll get to, to the actual detail in a minute. We've also been assisting with uh, Business for South Africa, looking at consignment inspections on procured um, uh, PPE um, that, that's, been, um, that's been bought for both the public health uh, sector as well as the private health sector. Uh, if you wouldn't mind moving to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, Jess, I think for us it's been uh, quite important from um, uh, just from an uh, occupational health and safety point of view that we adhere to all of the regulations and, and the protocols. We've activated an emergency response team uh, at our campus in Grundloof um, to ensure that um, there's business continuity uh, at all of the offices um, that, are, that are working as well as those that were coming on stream. Uh, we've done a very comprehensive hygiene uh, awareness campaign, looking at all preventative measures. Um, we did a walkabout yesterday at the campus just to make sure that as we are preparing for next week, when more people would be coming in, that, we, that we've that um, we adhered to all of the, the, the regulations. So in terms of making sure that we've got areas for isolation, should anything happen, um, the clinics, the occupational health and safety practitioner is on board um, and there's there's defined processes in place to manage that. We've also put a ban on our, all our travel um, and, and because uh, many of our um, certification auditors, they actually go out to um, clients in their premises. Um, and uh, so we, we, we've needed to, to do that. Um, we've also limited visits by customers and service providers to the campus. Sample delivery is scheduled and, and um, is managed uh, in accordance with the standard operating procedure. Um, we've uh, looked at, at remote working during level five and, um, and also level four. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Chair, one of the things that we've been um, managing is, is looking at ensuring that we maintain the 33% threshold at all times. And this is not just for SABS, it's for the actual entire SABS campus. Um, we've procured uh, PPE equipment, it's been issued, and we conduct um, screening for all staff um, or anybody coming into the entrances um, at, the, at the SABS uh, offices. Chair, the work that we've been doing is supporting essential services, primarily in, in these four areas, hand sanitizers, disinfectants, masks, through a joint partnership with Protechnic Laboratories and surgical gloves uh, and aprons. Can we move to the next slide? Thank you. The laboratories that we've um, that have worked during uh, lockdown levels uh, five and four have been the food microbiology, uh, pharmaceutical chemistry, fiber and polymers, industrial chemistry. Those two have been on standby. The condom lab started operating from the 20th of April and then the cement and radiation protection services has also um, been, um, been working. Thanks, the next slide. Thank you. Chair, so we've been able to liaise with the um, with ISO, um, the International Standardization Organization, to get free access um, for a limited set of standards. The intellectual property or the copyright in these standards is owned by ISO. And so we've been able to uh, 
through a, a discussions with them, get these standards. They're available on our website free of charge. Um, it's uh, the lung ventilators, medical devices, protective gloves, and business continuity management. So for anybody who is um, a SABS customer or potential SABS customer, these, these are available uh, to assist. Thank you. The next slide. So, Jay, just to talk about, but just about the letters of conformance um, or the consignment inspections, uh, as we call them, for the SABS uh, product certification or our mark scheme. Um, we've issued this as an interim license to allow the distribution of, uh, of PPE, where we've conducted audits, obviously pending finalization of the mark scheme process. Uh, so we've um, done these consignment inspections on respirator masks, surgical masks, and, and gloves. That work um, started under level five, and it's still continuing, uh, Chair. Thank you. Uh, so the, the next entity to present will be the NRCS. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Chair and Honourable Members. Um, it is now Edward Mamadise, the CEO of the NRCS. I'm not alone. I have been joined okay. by my colleagues. Okay. Chair. Yeah, yes, sir. Chair, I don't want to believe that everybody's got a, a, a network a problem. So I think we should, they should switch on their videos, please. This is for us and for the public, for South African citizens. Yeah. No, that's fine. Let, let's actually, the technical part, we'll actually check because I think the DDG said uh, she's not actually coming through clearly. Can we then just say uh, for the presenter um, that we actually then try get video and mic working? But if ever there's a technical hitch or problem, then we can survive with the, the voice, which is the mic. The video is not actually a big problem. So I think uh, you're right. Uh, let's show videos. If there's a problem, then we can actually just indicate. You can cross, proceed, uh, Edward. On. Thank you, Chair. Yes. Um, as I've said, I'm not alone. I'm with my colleagues. Abigail Tulari, she's our COO, Edward Matemba, our manager strategy, and Macy Katz, um, general manager for food, and Thomas Mazibe, general manager for um, chemical and materials, CMM. Um, now to the presentation chair. The NRCS at the start of the lockdown has been supporting essential services in CMM, where we process applications for chemicals, detergents, personal protective equipment, that will be your masks and uh, uh, disinfectants. We have also been supporting in the area of food, the fetal products, the canned meat and processed meat. Uh, in legal metrology, we have been supporting in terms of the measurements um, to ensure that there are no short measure, measurements in all packaged goods, including the PPE. In level four, the automotive was added, where now the automotive will be also su be supporting the essential uh, services. Um, obviously, with, we can move to the next slide. Who is moving the slides? Yes. Obviously, Chair, with the emergence of the pandemic, NRCS has to put the safety of our employees first. We had to develop an, a COVID plan the COVID plan include risk assessment, provision of PPE, 
uh, occupational health safety of all our employees, re-engineering our business processes and reorganizing ourselves to ensure that we are able to support the essential services. Um, I think the what is worth mentioning here, Chair, um, we have also been encouraging our staff to support the Solidarity Fund. We have created a platform within our payroll system that allow employees to make deductions directly to, to the Solidarity Fund um, using our payroll system. In fact, our executive members, Chair, have committed to donate 3,000 over a period of three months to the Solidarity Fund, including myself as the head. So we have set the tone from the top in terms of encouraging the employees to contribute to this fund. Now, in, in the chemical um, 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 and materials division, where we have been supporting the um, essential services, especially in the implementation of our compulsory specification for mask VC8072 of 2011. In response to the pandemic, we have re-engineered our processes and introduced a sales permit as a temporary approval process to make sure that we have mask uh, in the market quicker. We have identified key safety critical elements in the VC that the applicant would need to satisfy before they can be issued with a sales permit. These interim measures chair, were communicated via media to all the industries, the labs and the public so that they can know what to expect when making application. The application forms were made available on our website for easy accessibility for applicants. During the period of lockdown, Chair, we have received 100 applications for sales permits for masks. Out of those 90, only 90 have been registered. Some of them we found that they fall outside of the scope because they may be application for uh, uh, sanitizers which we do not yet regulate. We have issued 21 new sales permits. We have rejected seven for non-compliance with the safety critical elements that I've alluded to earlier on, and the two applications have been canceled. Overall, the average turnaround time has been 18 days. Can we move to the next slide? Working with other stakeholders, we have identified the gaps in the uh, regulatory space where we identified that sanitizers have not been regulated, which means that everyone is at the moment producing any uh, sort of a product and they can name it a sanitizer because there is no regulator to ensure that they are compulsory uh, requirements. In filling the gap, we have developed a compulsory specification for sanitizers, which we have submitted to the minister. We're still awaiting feedback from the minister in terms of the publication of that VC. In terms of the uh, market surveillance inspections, the market surveillance inspection have been affected severely by the lockdown and the pandemic. Um, we have limited to our inspection to um, safety critical um, um, matters where we receive complaints, specific complaints, and we have reduced inspections to mostly desk, desktop um, evaluation where we can um, detect non-compliances via other means including the internet, the social media, and, and so forth. 
In this area of chemicals and materials, we have received 10 complaints during the lockdown, which we are investigating. We have also collaborated with other key stakeholders chair in, in terms of inspections um, at the post of entry, including the South African Bureau of Standards, SAPRA, and uh, BSA. We are also participating in the National Committee of COVID-19 Occupational Health and Safety and PPE Committee comprising of Department of Health, DTIC, National Treasury, BSA, and other stakeholders. If we can move to the next slide. Now in the food area, we have developed an operational plan to ensure continuity to both the fishery and the meat industry, which plans have been communicated to the industry. We have classified, classified products in terms of risk, food safety, and we prioritize inspections accordingly. We have, in collaboration with the Department of Environment, Forestry and Fisheries, continued to process the process of monitoring sampling of live aquaculture animals to ensure farms remain productive, both in the Eastern and the Western Cape. This has allowed industry to have enough live export to be uh, uh, exported, uh, exported. If we can move to the next slide in terms of the frozen fish, we have adjusted the operation to assist the industry to, to be able to export um, frozen fishery products by registering most of the exporters on our on the electronic system called Traces. Traces is a European uh, system where any exporter can register for EC issuance of health guarantees. This process has allowed us to facilitate trade to those for, for those companies who wanted to export fishery products during a lockdown. We have supported the special cargo flights departing from the OR Tambo uh, International Airport by inspecting products at OR Tambo, issued, issuing health guarantees before the products can be exported. This has kept us busy, in, especially in our Pretoria offices. We have issued in total um, 1,231 health guarantees, including compliance certificates. We have conducted 1906 inspection during the period of lockdown in April. In total, we have assisted uh, 103 businesses, both local exporters and importers. If we can move to the next slide. We have, in terms of the non-compliance, we have identified the following non-compliances. Um, there was an incident of manipulation of best before date for food packs meant for South African Defence Force. The matter is still under investigation. It has been referred to our legal services for further investigation. In the meantime, we have issued a directive to the supplier to make sure that they recall the products um, and keep them in their possession until further um, notice once the investigation has been completed. We also received a complaint that we investigated in respect to the canned fish, which we found being sold in certain spaza shops. The canned fish in question, it is marked clearly not for sale because it is meant for a school feeding program administered by the Department of Education. We have investigated the matters and referred the complaints to the Department of Ed 
for further handling. In the legal metrology space, we have supported the essential services by making sure that we continue our market surveillance inspection. The inspection, as I've said, they focus mainly on desktop, desktop evaluation. We only do physical inspection where it is necessary to do so or is unavoidable. We have investigated in total four complaints, two complaints relating to uh, short measurements. The businesses in question have been sanctioned. We have also investigated two complaints relating to labeling requirements, and those businesses have been sanctioned. If we can move to the next slide. Continuing with the um, attack on non compliances, we have particip participated in provincial joint operations in the free state. Uh, with other uh, regulators and government departments. And, and in that process, we have uh, visited eight businesses, confiscated eight product lines for non, various non-compliance, including short measurements. If we can move to the next slide. And uh, before I close, Chair, I think that is the end of my presentation, but before before I close, let me just highlight that in uh, the impact of the COVID-19 has been felt um, um, also by NRCS. There are lessons that we have learned throughout the process, including the utilization of the ICT, ICT platforms to for business continuity. And we have um, learned that there are certain inspections and approvals that can be done remotely. We have also learned, uh, Chair, that we need to enhance cooperation with other key uh, stakeholders and entities. And lastly, um, we have um, realize that it is, up it is about time that we finalize the implementation of the modernization project to support our work going forward. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable thank Members. You. Okay, thank you. The next one. Thank you, Chairperson, and good afternoon, um, Chair and Honourable Members. Um, my name is Ron Josias. I'm the CEO of SANAS. I will just take you through our presentation. Next slide, please. Chairperson, I'll just um, talk um, within these four quadrants that we have um, addressed uh, our contribution, our changes with regards to the COVID-19, um, in the operational, financial, and um, personnel as regulatory side. And in our operations as such, as you know, uh, most of our work, in fact, the core of our work is to assess organizations' management system and then also verify the implementation and the competence on site uh, via witnessing using experts in those particular fields that we, we witness. And that is to confirm that we can agree that the organization is competent and therefore be in the position to provide them with the accreditation they might seek. So um, as you would appreciate during this period of the lockdown, we could not go on site. Um, we have implemented um, and optimized the use of ICT. We've implemented a remote assessment process this remote assessment process in line with the international standard that SANAS needs to comply with, which is the ISO IEC 17011 standard. Um, within that, we have excluded new applications. Um, we did accept the documentation for new application, but because we can't verify and witness them performing work on site, those were excluded from the remote assessment. The remote assessments are for those organizations who are already accredited and the surveillance, which we do on a continuous basis, um, that has continued. 
Um, we have also drafted a specific document to deal with the remote assessments and the management execution thereof, which is our P35 document, which has been made available to all um, um, the, the public as well as the conformity assessment bodies. Um, in the space of the finances chairperson, we have seen a huge increase, uh, quite uh, yeah, an increase in the withdrawals of accreditation um, uh, supported by or motivated by the economic conditions that the conformity assessment bodies such as laboratories, inspection bodies and certification bodies are under at this point in time. We have uh, implemented a rebate of uh, equivalent to about two months accreditation fees, uh, which we have now issued to all the accredited organizations. Um, and furthermore, we've also extended the payment period for annual fees um, from the normal uh, 60 days to 90 days. Um, chairperson as well as the COVID-19, um, a lot of the conformity assessment bodies were not that ready, has never tested it much for COVID-19. And we needed to ensure that the competence are there. We have, as Sun has um, decided, to extend the scope um, and the assessment and the verification of the co competence to test to COVID-19 uh, to do that for free. So um, the, uh, to those accreditation bodies who are already accredited and who has been testing similar uh, 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 tests as the COVID-19, um, we have about 13 of those medical laboratories that's currently in the process undergoing uh, the assessments of, of their competence to, to add to the scope of accreditation, the COVID-19. Chairperson, on the issue of the personnel, um, our people, our work, um, we continue to work as, um, as SANAS. Um, all our people are working from home. We have uh, provided them with all the necessary equipment. Um, in addition to that, their welfare was important to us as well. As you know, it's a quite a stressful time. Um, we have implemented and actually uh, strengthened our wellness support programs uh, as well as our counseling. We have an independent company that they can approach for counseling should that be required. So we have continued with those processes to make sure that our, our, our staff uh, are, are looked after as well. Um, over the past, we have established a task force, a COVID-19 task force since the beginning. And the, the task force has been meeting like uh, three times a week. Uh, very specifically, we were looking at the risk uh, um, and the risk assessment documentation or process that was laid out by the DEL, and we have implemented that. And um, pretty soon on the 1st of June, um, about a third of our staff will be going back, 33% uh, of our staff will be, be returning to work, and that will be done on a rotational basis. With regard to the regulators and regulations, we have been supporting also, the regulators um, assisting them. For, we have signed an agreement ourselves together with um, SABS as well, signed an agreement with CEDA to um, see how we can basically um, support SMEs to localize some of the uh, PPEs that's currently in demand. Um, that process is ongoing. There's a lot of discussion, a lot of advice coming from all the different structures at this, at this point in time. The second regulator that we've been engaging in quite a bit is SAPRA. SAPRA, as you know, SAPRA is the regulator for medical devices as well, um, which a lot of the, 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 the devices and equipment that we currently need falls under their responsibilities. Um, a core problem that existed there was the dissemination of the information to the to the um, relevant um, industry of how certain things work, how do you apply for the license under SAPRA, et cetera. We have, um, SAPRA has provided us that information as well, and we have distributed it and made that available on our websites as well to the uh, to the public as well as to, to industry. Next slide, please. Chair, then to be more specific, in our medical laboratory sites, um, the modern medical laboratories, largely uh, COVID-19 testing is done in medical laboratories. And as I said, we have about 12 of those laboratories, including the National Health um, Services Laboratories, that's currently in the process of preparing for the accreditation uh, of the COVID-19 testing, and that will start 
um, from next month, next month onwards, um, they'll be ready. They've already done a lot of work. As you know, part of our work is the documentation update, but secondly, the training of their staff, uh, as well as conducting proficiency testing to verify their uh, results again, other laboratories' results, and provide that information to us. In the space of our calibration laboratories, um, Chairperson, um, there's some good news in this process. Um, SANAS has just recently, um, in fact, in, in March, um, obtained international recognition to the International Laboratory Accreditation Corporation for uh, proficiency testing. Now we're part of the mutual recognition arrangement, the signature of which basically say we are equivalent to any other accreditation body. Uh, um, and our results should be should be accepted in those um, uh, countries where, which um, assign the mutual recognition arrangement. We are one of only nine accreditation bodies in the world that has obtained that status. Um, Chairperson, um, the, in the calibration, yes, there is a lot of questions at the moment and there is a lot of work being done on the COVID-19 testing, for PT proficiency testing that's being put in place. Um, one of the other areas that we're also now looking at very specifically is, is obviously infrared uh, um, thermometers as well, thermometers. What we currently have, even though we have some accredited laboratories, um, the challenge that we have is the, 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 the ability of these laboratories to be able to calibrate within a specific um, narrow band of, 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 of uncertainty. Um, there is a task force or working group currently finalizing a technical document um, that will be made available to uh, the laboratories, etc., to be able to um, measure to a lower level that we can actually accredit, uh, a finite uh, level that we can actually accredit them to. The next slide, please. With regards to the uh, um, PPE testing um, for our testing laboratories, yes, we have created basically um, three laboratories uh, for sanitizers, disinfectants, and soaps. Um, currently, uh, one of our big challenges is the mask. Um, we do not have an accredited organization that can test the mask. However, under the NRCS, they have given permission to a laboratory um, to do such um, um, uh, uh, testing. Very specifically, the challenge here is there's some laboratories might be able to, to measure for bacteria, um, but not necessarily for, for, for viruses. And, and, and obviously, um, we're still looking at um, the necessary competency in this particular area as well. With regards to our inspection bodies, the inspection bodies continue to do work in the X-ray equipment. Obviously, the diagnostics uh, and the accuracies of that um, through our X-ray um, equipment is quite important. So they continue with the inspection function in that in that in that particular area. With regard to arbiters in terms of arbiters in terms of the the meat etc as well those ones continue as well and as well as the gas and the gas test stations very specifically focusing on the on the safety of our gas cylinders um, as you know the gas is becoming now more and more important specifically in the areas of the hospitals and clinics etc where um, we need to ensure the safety of those cylinders um, as we're using them as we go along um, the next slide please In the space of triple BEE chairperson, um, we had to change also the the standard that these the triple BEE um, bodies comply with, which is R forty seven, and that is to make provision for them to do also remote assessments or um, electronic assessments, as what we call it, um, and that is to ensure that the work can continue and we can monitor that process. So the standard was was meant to allow them to do such work in this space so the PEE certificates could still be issued during this time, um, during the lockdown, lockdown time as well as going forward. The next slide, please. Chairperson, we just added the slide to see where we're going with the organization in terms of preparing, obviously, the challenge that we, we will be dealing with um, within the next few months and also after COVID-19, the after effects of COVID-19. 
is the issue of sustainability. And there we already started to look at adjusting our strategic plans um, to ensure that we can actually uh, come out on the other side uh, without having too much reliance on government for the, the funding. So we were looking at very specifically the issue of efficiency, optimizing the use of ITC. We have learned a lot of lessons. Part of the remote assessments that we've done so far was actually to gather information of the experiences of those uh, conformity assessment bodies that we've assessed via the remote assessments. We now have a, a library of, of lessons learned and we're already starting to incorporate that into our, our, our systems and processes to ensure that it might not only be a once off but we might be able to continue to use and see how we can optimize ITC in this particular space. We're also going to have to look at more, much more in terms of expanding our offerings, uh, the, the accreditation scopes, um, as well as uh, increase on the uh, training part. On the value addition part is the, um, we will now um, also start to roll out the e-certificates, um, accreditation certificates, where the organizations will get the first page and the scope of accreditation will be on the SANA's website and it will be controlled uh, and, and live all the time so that anybody can see exactly who's accredited and what they're accredited for. Um, then, Chair, with regards to the, the, the organizational setup, um, we have learned a lot from this COVID-19 and one of those areas is, is in fact, yes, we can indeed work from home and we can be efficient working from home. Um, and so the issue of flexibility and some of the lessons that we're going to have to take forward, uh, the issue of access and control improvements, um, we, is some of the lessons that we're taking forward um, as well, um, what we learned from this. In addition to that, also, we've also set up with Insanas the uh, 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 the mechanism to be, for our staff to contribute to the national fund uh, as well. Uh, next slide. Chairperson, um, uh, as this is my last um, presentation to the portfolio committee, as I will be leaving the employee of Sanus on tomorrow, um, I would like to thank the portfolio committee and I also would like to thank Cabinet for the opportunity to have served over the 22 years that I've been with the organization. And I thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Well received. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for informing us. Thanks. Can we take the next presentation? Oh, good afternoon, honorable members. Um, good afternoon, Chairperson and yeah. colleagues. My name is Ndwakuru Mukufi, the CEO of NEMISA. I will be taking you through um, work that NEMISA has been doing in responding to the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Um, maybe I should just start by indicating that um, May is not only Africa month, it's also metrology month. So we have celebrated World Metrology Day on the 20th of May. Like everything else, um, Chairperson, we had to celebrate it online. So we did the best that we could to publicize the events that are happening. And the focus has been on how metrology continues to contribute to um, essential services in this regard, the um, service of um, fighting against the coronavirus pandemic, even though the theme for World Metrology Day this year was um, measurements for international trade, we had to focus on how we contribute towards ensuring that all measurements that are done in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic are accurate and um, globally accepted. Um, going back to Anemisa, being the last to present of the four TI entities, I will not um, talk a lot about our um, organization internally, how we organized ourselves to ensure that our personnel are safe, um, to ensure that um, our clients are also um, adopting the necessary social distancing to ensure that we curb the spread of the virus. Um, in short, I will just say, we activated our disaster management plan and in line with our disaster management plan 
the disaster recovery team has been guiding the organization in response to um, the pandemic and aligned to the relevant um, regulations that have been published by the different government um, departments um, to ensure that we stop the spread. We um, are holding our meetings over um, online platforms such as Teams, um, Skype and Zoom when um, necessary. And to ensure the um, well-being of our staff, we have activated the employee wellness program um, where interventions are being um, made to ensure that um, staff that are operating from um, home and those that have to come in um, who are mainly essential services and emergency um, calibrations that we have to do to support essential services are properly um, supported. Um, following the lockdown, we, as I indicated, um, worked from home. Um, when we moved to level four, some laboratory um, work has resumed. Um, and this is under very strict occupational health and safety guidelines to ensure that the national measurement standards are compared. As you heard from the previous um, presentations from NRCS and SANAS, it is important that our um, measurements that we um, conduct in the country are um, comparable to the rest of the world and they are accurate. Um, we, in level four, continue to um, supply the certified reference material that we had produced previously, but the preparation of um, the certified reference material will only resume in um, level three. If we can go to the next slide, please. We continue to provide um, our services. Um, the list of services that we provided is um, on the screen there. Um, what I want to just pick up on is um, just a few. Um, the important one being the reference gas mixtures that we've been supplying to gas um, manufacturers and producers um, to ensure that, as you know, um, I think um, the CEO of the NRCS also indicated, actually it's, it's Sanas that indicated that um, gases have become very important at this stage and we've been providing the reference materials, which are the purified reference um, gas mixtures um, that the um, manufacturing plants use to um, test for their purity, um, the, to ensure that um, we have um, proper um, gases that are provided to, to um, patients when required. We've been calibrating in the x-ray space, um, um, dosimeters and for radiotherapy departments, we've been um, calibrating radio protection um, equipment. If, if we can go to the next slide, please. In the area of um, food services, we continue to prepare the proficiency testing schemes that um, need to go out in May and June. The ones that were supposed to go out in May have already gone out um, as we speak, and we continue to prepare for those that will be going out in June. And there is a um, contract that we received from the IAEA um, for food safety in Africa, where we provide proficiency testing schemes for um, food um, producers, um, be it um, laboratories that test for farmers or for processors, um, we've been um, appointed to provide the proficiency testing schemes. I, I want to also emphasize what was um, highlighted by um, Ron, um, the CEO of SANAS. They are um, a recognition um, by um, ILEC for, for proficiency testing schemes. We have been accredited for providing proficiency testing schemes. So we benefited from that recognition that um, SANAS um, received, that we don't have to use an overseas accreditation body to accredit our own proficiency testing schemes that we are now providing for um, 
products such as um, peanut slurry for um, testing for aflatoxins, for um, pesticides in sweet peppers, for uh, mycotoxins in cassava, for aflatoxins M1 in milk, for pesticides um, testing in bananas, for pesticide residues in pears, as well as toxic elements in different products such as um, cocoa um, powder and um, toxic elements in um, maize meal. So those are the uh, PT schemes that we have been um, conducting um, during this period. If we can go to the next slide. Um, we got involved in special projects that are specifically um, developed in response to the um, pandemic. One important one was um, work that we've been doing with the CSIR for developing a handheld UVC light-based um, surface disinfection device so that um, the public transport um, vehicles such as um, taxis can be disinfected at the changeover points using this um, UVC. Having the capability for measuring UVC and calibrating this equipment. We um, have been involved in this uh, project providing the measurement solutions and the measurements required in that project. Um, in the area of ventilators, we've been um, providing measurement solutions to a company that um, has invented a UVC air disinfection system that would be used in ventilators. We've been providing the measurement solutions um, to ensure that the calibration would be in line with international standards and accurate. Um, again, still talking about disinfection, we are providing measurement solutions to two companies. One company that has developed a UVC disinfection chamber we are helping them with testing the efficacy of the UVC as well as the safety of the device when it's um, used by um, the, the users. Um, the other company, um, we are providing measurements on disinfection units um, for a touch-based fingerprint identification unit. I must indicate we've um, been part of um, the consortium that is looking at the National Ventilator Project, um, such that as we have made submissions, NEMISA will be providing the measurement solutions that are required to ensure that the produced ventilators are complying with the strict um, medical requirements to ensure that it provides the life-saving service that is um, required. If we can move to the next slide, please. I think that would um, be my last slide, just to indicate that um, like the other TI entities and the DTISO, we've learned lessons that indicate that there are different ways of doing things than what we've gotten used to. One of which um, that I just want to highlight and emphasize is the ability to work um, off-site, going to the site only when the physical laboratory work needs to be done, such that we limit the number of people that goes into the organization. And we've been able to do it as NEMISA over the lockdown period. And we intend to continue um, to enhance our operation to ensure that the resources are applied with um, the necessary social distancing whilst we enhance the output um, that we give. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Um, uh, okay. Continue. Chair, uh, through you, Chair. Uh, um, the, the DTI, uh, Ms. Pele, uh, perhaps you'll do the conclusions. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you, DTI. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Chair. I think as a way of concluding, the one point that we would like to raise is that over the last two months or so, we have learned a couple of lessons uh, as the department together with the entities. Um, 
key to that is that we are acknowledging that the world post COVID-19 will be very different. The extent and the depth of the change and the impact is still unknown. However, this change requires that we continue to adapt the way that we are living in our working environments. In terms of the entities themselves, modernization of ICT systems is critical uh, to ensure that we continue to offer additional uh, services uh, remotely, including assessments, uh, inspections, and issuing of the e-certificates. The integrated nature of the, IT, the technical infrastructure work uh, requires that uh, there should be a seamless uh, process uh, of working as the inter uh, entities uh, in, in order to collaborate on addressing new needs as they emerge. And also partnering with other regulators, for example, in the COVID-19 space, uh, SAPRA, that some of the CFO, COOs have already spoken about, as a, as a, as a key regulator for uh, medical products. Um, the, in the process itself, the, the, the pandemic has really heightened the important role uh, that is being played by the technical infrastructure entities. And that it's important that government responses uh, ought to include the technical uh, entity practitioners on set as we are contemplating responses to issues. On an operational level, uh, uh, it is anticipated that the pandemic uh, will have a negative impact on the entity's revenues. I think the uh, Edward, uh, CEO of uh, NRCS, articulated some of these issues, and also uh, Jody also articulated some of the issues in relation to SAPS. And therefore, it requires that we, we, we look at how we can adapt our strategy and our programs going forward to ensure that we are able to be as responsive as possible. Um, thanks, Chair. We will end here. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to come and share the work of the technical infrastructure institutions. Thank you very much. I'm sure then it gives the opportunity to get the honorable members of the committee to actually pick up on the questions, comments, and if ever there's any um, issues that they think should be highlighted or looked at. Can I invite uh, members of the portfolio committee to actually um, respond or ask questions or comment. Chair? Uh, Secretariat, can mm. I check uh, members who will be interested? Ms. Yako, uh, Chair? Okay. Yako. Yako, I was told that you, you actually came in. Thank you very much and welcome. Yako will be the first one. Thank uh, you. Who will, be, who will be the other next one after Yako? Followed by Mr. Mr. Ms. Mutahum. Okay. Can we go, Yako? Honorable Yako, floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, mine is basically just a comment. Um, I know that we, we really struggled with um, these entities, uh, especially NRCS and ACBS, in terms of performance in the last financial years. Um, and I'm worried that with the, with the COVID situation happening now and with the need to, to, to intensify more work under ACPS and NRCS especially, um, are they coping? And also, um, the CEO of, of NRCS has highlighted the fact Honorable that Yako. Um, they are Honorable Yako. Yako. Can you hear me? Hello? Honorable Yako, you yes. were actually uh, mm -hmm. uh, not very clear on the second part. And uh, yeah, okay. maybe, maybe it's your image mm -hmm. that actually affects yeah. your voice. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, but much better. Okay. Yeah, I think you'll do the um, second I'll... part. Yes, my question basically is that what is SCPS and NRCS doing in terms of making sure that they they have the capacity, first of all, with us going to level three, there'll be a more need for um, accredited and regularized um, PPE material. And I see that they are, are shortcuts being made by some companies as the demand gets bigger. Um, how, what is the interaction with the department in making sure that we don't, or our children who are going back to school, um, don't don't get PPE material that's substandard? And, and also, um, NLCS mentioned that there are 10 complaints, and I'm wondering, what is their complaint system and how do they resolve those complaints? 
um, yeah, that's, those are the questions that I have so far. Okay. Thank you very much. Can you take um, Ms. Mutahum, Chair? Mutahum. Thanks, Chair. Uh, let me welcome the presentation from our entities. I have only two questions. My first question goes to three entities, Minisa, Sanas, and, R and NRCS. I just want to check what lessons have they learned by the technical infrastructure institution during the lockdown, and how does they intend to change the way of doing things as a result of lessons learned? Uh, my second question was, um, was there any incident of uh, certificates that were issued fraudulently or illegal? Thanks, Chair. Okay. okay. Can we take the next? Uh, yes, I'm Mr. There. Mr. Mulder, followed by Mr. Mbuyani. Uh, Honorable Mulder. Honorable Mulder, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Chair. Can you can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, my question is directed to the presenters of of all four institutions, the SABS, the NRCS, SANAS, and NMISA. Um, and in considering the six administrations reimagined industrial strategy as a central strategy to deepen industrial development, and the challenges that these four institutions, especially the, the SABS and the NRCS, experienced during the last financial year, and the fact that the department's budget uh, will most probably be cut back after the Minister of Finance's soon to be adjusted uh, budget vote. My question is, will the four institutions still be in a position to implement, implement um, th this industrial strategy? Um, yeah, let's just get to that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Wilder. Uh, uh, Mboyane, I think. Chairperson, thank you very yeah. much, Chair. Uh, let me start by welcoming the presentation, Chairperson. I've got a few clarification questions here. Uh, maybe one will start with the... Uh, maybe with you the, actually just, just uh, switch off your image so that maybe you can improve your voice. Okay. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, image is not visible yeah. now, Chair. Voice, voice much better. Thank you. I just wanted to check one on the issues of the mandate uh, from uh, the three entities. Maybe the one is with tariff uh, investigation and also trade uh, remedies and uh, the input and export uh, uh, process. On the one, Chair, is the import facilitation. In terms of the duty, uh, the duty already. It's in section 15 of the IT. Um, we're still yes. not very clear, but um, if you can try it, I'm not sure if ever you have to speak louder or stay, be steady when you speak. Try I'm again steady. so that we can just check uh, how audible. Yes, Chairperson. Yeah. I'm audible enough. Yes, okay, much better. Yes, Chairperson. One will be in terms of the import uh, import facilitation. I just wanted to check the duty, the duty rate in terms of the section 15 of the ITEC, Chairperson. And also check in terms of their process, uh, how many NPO benefited uh, from uh, their, their, their process of COVID uh, regulation. <clears throat> Yeah, most the ones uh, in, in rural uh, areas, Chairperson. And on the export restriction, we told that the WTO, uh, the WHO uh, agreement article is an exception of non-discrimination. I just need clarity on that one, and also the non the, the no restrictions one on the WTO agreement, Chairperson. Article of exception. Uh, maybe, Chairperson, on the issue of 
wellness program uh, from Tana. They uh, spoke of wellness program uh, and also and also. I just wanted to check uh, uh, the aggregation process uh, while they were in lockdown. Uh, how possible is it for the uh, accreditation to, to be facilitated? And who is verifying the the the, the PE, uh, agent, Chaperson, as we speak? And maybe the last one in terms of the lesson learned by the technical infrastructure uh, as a whole, the entity. Uh, what is it that they can tell us that they've learned from this COVID-19 uh, moving forward? And also, what is it that they have in terms of integrated approach uh, when they deal with this risk adjusted approach? Uh, maybe I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Muyane. And Chairperson, Mrs. Yes. Hermans, Chair. Honorable Hermans. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I would just like to know, uh, Chairperson, if uh, I suppose this is across all four entities, uh, what, what is the lockdown impact on our existing trade agreements, both uh, on the continent and uh, at an inter international level? I am glad to hear that um, they've looked at lessons learned because I think what we are learning now during the lockdown is going to change the way we do uh, work and also hopefully improve the way we do our work going forward. Then let me just lastly wish uh, Ron Josias, the CEO of SANAS, well on his onward journey and appreciate the contribution that he has made to our uh, technical infrastructure uh, department uh, in trade and industry. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Hammond. Uh, the next one. Chair, I have no further questions on, uh, on the chat that I can see, Chair. Okay. C can we then um, agree to go to the entities and the department to be able just to respond to the questions raised by members. Can I actually ask them to come through? You can indicate uh, the department can actually guide us. Uh, DDG. Thanks, Chair. I think in the order that we have presented, I think let's give uh, SAP's uh, lead administrator an opportunity to uh, uh, respond first, and we'll follow as we had uh, done the presentation. Jody? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, DDG. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, um, just to indicate, I'm joined by uh, quite a bit of the SAP's team. I have Mr. Katima Temba. He's the um, head of the uh, certification services, Mr. Lizo Makela, the executive responsible for HR, Johan Conradi looking at strategy, uh, Lungelo is um, business development, sales, uh, laboratory services, um, and we've also got uh, Niels um, on the line. I'm just also just quickly going, and Dr. Sadvir Pisun, the head of standards. So. I'm supported by a, a, a fairly large team, uh, Chair, and they'll come in and, and, and assist. Um, Chair, I think just in response to, um, I think, Honorable Yakov, your, your question about entities' performance, I think that is something that is uh, confronting us at the uh, Bureau of Standards right now. Um, what, what we have done is we've undertaken an organizational review, um, and, and we are looking at a, a revised strategy looking at some of the key sectors um, that the DTIC is focusing on, on at the moment. And I think, Honorable Mulder, this also touches in part on your question. Um, and so we, we, we are embarking on a process to map out our, ex, our existing capacity with, uh, with kind of what we can do in terms of accreditation, uh, both product and systems, and then um, uh, testing uh, in, in the sectors. Um, I think the um, what 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 we have done is with the department is um, uh, look re 
prioritize some of our um, activities. I think we've done this um, under lockdown five so that it's focusing on the essential services and what it is that we can do. I think one of the key lessons for me has certainly been that um, I don't think we were as prepared, I think, as a as an institution uh, to look at all of the PPEs. For, so for instance, if you look at medical devices, um, respirators and ventilators, or ventilators isn't something that we have the capacity to test. Uh, so, you know, so I think we're looking at expanding the capacity to test masks, cloth masks, and the, the ventilators. And we, um, uh, Lungelo, if, he, if he'd like to come in, he can just give us a sense about uh, some of that we've been having. Um, then, Chair, um, I think Honourable uh, Mutahong has asked if there are any um, certificates that have been issued fraudulently. No, uh, certificates haven't been issued fraudulently, not to, not to our knowledge at the moment. But what has happened is that there has been um, a misrepresentation of the mark. So on, um, I think it was on a, a product, these, um, I call them disinfectant chambers, um, they had put the SABS mark on that, indicating that we had actually um, uh, approved that product, which was incorrect. And we acted, our legal department sent a letter. They apologized and, and withdrew that and then had indicated that the SABS mark is only applicable on the cackle that is used inside that, inside that chamber. Uh, Honourable Malta, I think as we're going through the process of our um, revising our strategy, I think it will emerge um, in terms of what are the areas in which we can support the um, reimagined industrial strategy going forward, looking at the impact of, of COVID um, on, on, on key sectors in the economy. And obviously, we'd be uh, led by, by the department in terms of um, what, what those key sectors would be. Um, I think just, um, Honourable Buyani, your question just about what, what we've learned. And I think we had a discussion, Ron, Dwakulu, um, Edward and I, and I think the importance, and I think Tandi, um, DDG, Tandi had, had alluded to this um, earlier, is that the technical infrastructure institutions need to be in the room when policy discussions are being made. Because often it's at the tail end that we get brought in. Uh, and I think there the, the could be benefit in bringing the technical infrastructure institutions in a lot sooner um, so that we can actually uh, manage the playing field and communicate this um, in terms of a very seamless flow, who does what um, in, in, the, in the value chain. I think, Chair, th those are the questions that I have, but let me just check, is there anybody from SABS that would, uh, would like to come in? If, sorry, through you, Chair. Apologies, through you. Well, the floor is yours. The floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Uh, colleagues, oh, the CFO is also in. Uh, chair, I, I didn't, I didn't recognise her earlier. She's uh, Ms. Tina Maharaj. Uh, Lungelo, do you, did you want to come in just in terms of um, some of the testing, or or uh, Katima, just in in terms of some of the consignment inspections that we've that we've done? I can come in, Chair. It's Lungela. Thanks, Lungela. Okay, thanks, 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 Jody. Uh, uh, good afternoon, honorable members. And uh, just to add to what Jody has presented, um, it, in, it is true that the COVID-19 has exposed in terms of the testing capabilities, although we have managed to support some of the essential products. But uh, uh, what we have also learned is that the, the opportunity to collaborate with both uh, upcoming companies and well-established institutions uh, uh, it's something that we're taking forward in that regard we've we've been working with the csir in terms of the development of a prototype uh, for for testing uh, invasive and uh, invasive, invasive air respirators but also we've been coordinating with the protechnic and in enhancing the relationship more so on the on the medical products but internally, what we are also doing is that we're looking at uh, developing testing capabilities uh, for, for masks and, uh, and also in terms of the, the respirators and uh, the approval for that uh, capex is going through the, the relevant delegation of authority. So we, we are foreseeing that uh, within the next few months, once we go through the procurement process and the likes, then we can be able to, to then uh, in-house those capabilities and then the, the country can be better set. Thanks. Thanks, Jay. Okay. And thanks, thanks, Lungelo. Katima, did you just want to talk a bit about the consignment inspections that we've um, supported business for South Africa, or you covered? 
Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jody. Uh, and good afternoon, honorable members. Thank you, Chair. No, I think you, you've covered all the issues, Jody, but I can reinforce uh, the fact that um, indeed we have been very active in supporting BSA in performing these consignment inspections. And the turnaround times have been ranging from four hours to four hours to twenty-four hours response in making sure that these consignments uh, inspections are done properly. Further to that, uh, we've seconded about uh, 24 auditors who are dedicated to perform desktop reviews for BSA on enrolling of suppliers who wants to procure and do business in providing these uh, essential products that are required during this period. Uh, so, and that has been successful thus far since level five uh, restrictions and to date that is ongoing, it's gaining momentum and the auditors continue to exchange on a roster basis to make sure that all these stuff that have been procured meet the right requirements. And of course also to add on the integ integrated approach, uh, yes indeed we have been collaborating with other regulators, SAPRA being one of them, NRCS of course, uh, our sister entity also, we've been collaborating particularly on the inspectorate, inspection front in carrying out the work. Yes, indeed, some of the challenges and the impact we have realized is in relation to our day-to-day -day activities, execution of uh, audit work as we always do from a certification point of view. Of course, that is measured in line with the accreditation restrictions we have to observe so we cannot just um, just carry out a remote audits as and when we think we can do so. There are guidelines that we have to observe as provided by the accreditation body. In this case, will be SANAS and IAF, IAF guidelines. But a number of audits that were scheduled and planned before the lockdown, most of them have been deferred. And hopefully, as we move to a level three restriction, we'll have to cover some ground in that regard. Thank you, Jody. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, thanks, Katima and Lungelo. Chair, I think just in, in summary, uh, we are busy looking at the impact of um, COVID on our, on our financial situation, especially given the fact that about 60 to 70 percent of our customer base are SMMEs. And so there's a piece of work that DDG uh, Tandi Pele has asked that we do, and I think some meetings are in the process of being arranged for us to have those discussions with the department. Uh, Chair, I think that's it from SABS. I'll hand over to back to Tandi. Thank you. Okay, okay Tandi. Thank you, Judy. Uh, Edward, I think you should be the one who's talking next. Thank you, Tandi. Uh, thank you, Honourable Members, for the questions. Uh, let me start first with um, Honourable Yako. Um, you raised an issue on the impact on the NRCS turnaround plan. Um, I thought that discussion will be happening on the 24th of June, based on the program that has been sent to us. But um, um, in a nutshell, in, we have been severely impacted by the pandemic in the implementation of our uh, turnaround plan, especially in the uh, completeness of, of, of revenue. Um, most companies that needed to be inspected for levy compliance have been closed under lockdown five. Um, some of them still continue to be closed under level uh, four. Um, that will obviously have an impact in terms of how we make sure that these companies are able to declare and, and uh, uh, levies and pay our levies. Um, that, that, yeah, I think that is uh, 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 the obvious impact that we have determined so far. We are still finalizing the overall impact assessment of COVID-19 on our operations and, and, and in their way forward. Um, our complaint system, um, uh, Honorable Yaku, 
we have given the information, we made information available on our website where people can log the complaints. We have given an email address for each area of business where a person can log. If it is related to mask, CMM details are there. You, you, we are, people are able to lodge complaints. The complaints will be reviewed by the head of the division. And if inspection is required, it will be uh, given to inspectors to fully investigate the complaints. Um, Honorable uh, Mutaum, um, the lessons learned, I think we have covered most of the lessons learned, but just to add that um, obviously for us, it means that we have to accelerate the pace of implementing the modernization um, project so that we can maximize the utilization of informa information technology uh, systems, uh, especially in supporting exports, imports, and, 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 and trade facilitation. Um, in respect of the issuance of fraudulent certificates, we, there is none that has been reported or that we are aware of as the NRCS. Um, Honorable uh, Melda, yes, um, I think I also echo the words of uh, Jody Scott, the administrator of SAPS, when she said that um, the infrastructure entities have to be involved earlier on in the policy discussion, um, including the reimagine uh, um, industrial strategy that the DTIC has implemented under the sixth administration. Um, we have, uh, just to give you an example, in the, in, the, in the automotive sector, we know there is a master plan for automotive, um, but um, we haven't been part of those discussions. But what we find is, um, when the regulator now comes with issues of compliance by the automotive, it seems as if we are contradicting what the government is doing in terms of, 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 of our in, in enforcement strategy. For example, the issue of export levies. While government is trying to encourage the exports uh, of vehicles, we are saying pay us levies for those exports. So I think that that it is important. It is important that we get involved at earlier stage when the policy discussions are uh, are being developed. Um, in terms of us being having capacity to support the industrial strategy or imagine industrial strategy, we are capacitated, uh, chair, and and we will be able to support government in all the identified areas. Honorable Mbuyani, my apology, I struggled to hear what you were saying. I heard you speaking about import facilitation duty. We, we don't charge any duty for import facilitation. Um, the, the inspections that we do at the post of entry are um, uh, ordinary market surveillance inspections. Um, the person only needs to apply for an LOA, um, which is a pre-approval -pre process that an entity that wish to import uh, products that are regulated needs to follow. Other than that, we don't charge any other duties or, or, or import duties. And um, I think the process of the development, I heard you spoke some, uh, something about WTO. Um, I assume that you were talking about technical uh, barriers to trade in the context of WTO. We, ju we just want to assure you as in the development of compulsory specification, the process already taken into account that the 
proposed compulsory specification does not become unnecessary technical uh, uh, technical barrier to to trade so that is taken care at an early stage of the development of um um uh, compulsory specification um lastly you ask on the npo that's the question i'm only answering the question that i heard from you on the npo we don't classify uh the companies that we regulate according to whether they are npos private companies or and so forth our our only classification is based on whether a company is um a levy payer or not a levy payer that is the only classification that we utilize as the nrcs at this stage so we won't be able to um provide information whether we were able to assist any npos um i think i have uh, uh, answered all the questions chair back to uh tandy thank you edward thank you edward. Uh, um ron i think you are the next one thank you very much um and thank you chair i think my question starts from your honorable motong um with regards to issues of lesson le lessons learned um, and it's quite correct. A lot of um, of the lessons learned has already been been stated by the previous um, my previous colleagues or my colleagues as such. Um, but principally, I think we we, we all realise that um, the way of work will never be the same again after the COVID nineteen. And secondly, we know that our challenge is not. The, the big challenge is not what we're facing right now. The big challenge that we're going to face is still coming. The issue of the impact of COVID-19 on organizations, on, on employment, etc. And therefore, um, in my presentation earlier on, I spoke about the importance of reviewing our strategies to accommodate uh, the new environment in which we're going to move and we, which we're going to face going forward. So that's one of the key lessons we've learned in the space of our customers uh, lessons that we're learning through this particular process as well is that they are indeed price sensitive but the role that they pl play is, is extremely important and so we need to make uh, and have some interventions um, to support our customers as well to be able to deliver to the broader south africa ensuring that our goods and services um, are, are safe and healthy and 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 and, and be able um, to facilitate trade across borders and across the world uh, as well. Um, in our space of ITC, I think we spoke a lot about that. Um, one lesson that we've learned is not as scary as we thought and it's not as difficult as we thought. That's actually the feedback that we get from our customers as well. Things are happening from our feedback. Um, uh, people are actually getting much more comfortable with doing online assessments. Uh, etc. So um, the things that we feared before is not actually real. That's one of the key lessons we've learned as well through this particular process. Um, and obviously, uh, with regards to our finances as well, um, this link into the question that Honorable Mulder was talking about in terms of the industrial strategy, um, the ability to move forward going to depend a lot on how we review what we currently have to ensure the sustainability of the organizations as well. Um, currently, we should be able, we are comfortable that we would be able to, 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 to realize um, and, 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 and make a positive contribution to the industrial uh, strategy um, but like I said a lot of the issues gonna uh, we're gonna have to really look we're gonna have to tighten up uh, a lot on what we currently have before us as well as come up with new ways uh, and, and add new uh, uh, schemes to our, our, our current um, offerings um, to ensure that we can actually deliver on our national priorities with regards to the question on the on the fraud certificates as such, um, currently we have not recorded. We do have a hotline. We also have a, a, a direct complaints mechanism uh, in place um, uh, in terms of fraud and certificates, accreditation certificates. We have not received any during this period um, that, that, that has been recorded as such. With regards to the question of honorable um, by Riani, um, the there's a couple of questions. Uh, I didn't catch all of it, but I would just want to add to what um, the CEO of NRCS um, said in terms of the principles of the WTO 
um, and very specifically uh, uh, as captured in the WTO Technical Barriers to Trade Agreement. The accreditation complies to those requirements and it's been set up around those requirements as captured in that particular agreement, um, specifically on all the seven principles that's captured within in, in that document. Um, there was a question um, relating to the BEE. I didn't catch all of it, but I assume it is basically about um, the issue of continued uh, continuation of providing services. Yes, as I mentioned in my in my presentation, we have had to revise the the standard um, that they comply with to allow them to do remote. Uh, um, evaluations of the necessary um, information they need to uh, need to verify. Um, similarly, we have done that as well as NRC, as I said, we have done that also for the certification bodies that also need to go on site most of the time and verify some information. So we've also had to open up some of the requirements um, to allow them to do that. Obviously, there is lots of um, controls built into those processes to ensure that the integrity of the system is not compromised as such. Um, with regards to who checks the BEEs, um, we have not stopped the, uh, that work. As I said, we have continued. We do that via the remote um, assessments as well. We uh, continue to do the surveillance assessments as they um, proceed on a day-to-day basis. And obviously, if there is issues, we will pick it up either through the market or through our complaints mechanisms um, if there is matters that uh, is worrying some. Um, I would like to thank Honorable Hermans for those good wishes and um, Chair, I think that's all the ones that we have. Uh, with regards to the question on the impact of regional and international agreements, as you know, um, Sun has um, operated within both those two areas on the regional side as well as in international. On the regional side, we deal through the African Accreditation Corporation, which I'm currently the chairperson of. Um, we also had to adjust. Um, we continue to meet also. Um, we have our General and Executive Committee meetings um, via, via Zoom as well. Um, and so that process continue to ensure that that body remains stable as well as be able to grow to address the issue of uh, as coming with the continental free trade area, the needs for conformity assessment within that particular space. So we continue to do that on the international front. Um, just yesterday, um, we had a joint um, ILAC and IAF um, uh, 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 executive committee meeting um, in that particular space. Uh, uh, it's about 120 economies. It's normally uh, uh, belong to ILAC and IAF, and then the executive committees comes out of those ones. We also had the meeting there yesterday. Um, so the impact in general is not that big, apart from our ability to be able to meet face to face as such, but the work continues on a day to day basis. Um, so we, we are able to meet our obligations and the agreements that we have signed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. And Dr. can you take uh, us through the last batch of questions? Yes, th thank you, Tandi. Um, thank you, honorable members, for the questions. Um, Chair, I think most of the questions have been answered by the three CEOs. I will restrict myself to um, the one asked by Honorable Mutawung um, on the lessons learned. Um, a lot of lessons learned have been highlighted already. The one that I want to highlight is um, the importance of the way we prioritize our focus areas. I think it's, it's one of the biggest lessons that we learned. Some of the things that we took for granted that we will always be able to source from other parts of um, the world. We've realized that we need to develop our own capabilities so that we can be able to support our own industries to produce these products when they are required. And, and I think it's, it's one of the um, biggest lessons. I think post COVID-19 sustainability um, is something that we are, as um, Nemesa, my team and I have been considering quite a lot as to how the environment, the trade environment, and how the manufacturing environment locally is going to be, and what services from the technical infrastructure are going to be required to ensure that we stimulate the growth of our economy. 
And it is in that process that this issue of prioritization, some of the things that we didn't even think we will need to develop um, about six months ago, we realized that we need to develop those capabilities so that we can support our own economy. I mean, the restriction of the movement of goods um, has taught us some lessons that we, we, we need to be able to quickly move into a space where we are able to produce um, our own um, products. And the way we do foresighting um, as well, um, where we used to do things in the way the economies do things, um, walking backwards, looking at what happened in the past to predict the future. Um, we are finding that we have to turn around and look the other way so that we can be able to um, anticipate what is coming and prepare for it. And as the base of the um, technical infrastructure, we need to be ready because the accreditation that needs to be done, the testing and um, the um, certification that needs to be done requires a very sound measurement infrastructure so that everything can be um, relied on. I think I will um, limit myself to commenting on that question as the other questions have been um, thoroughly dealt with. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Dr. Kulu. Through you, Chair, I think on my side, can I just add one point? Uh, Honorable Mbuyani asked a couple of questions in relation to import duty rebates and export permit uh, process. I think those are the two instruments that we have utilized under the International Trade and Administration Act to facilitate uh, and ensure that we have got adequate supply of PPE in the domestic market to meet the domestic needs. Uh, but I request that we park the conversation on those instruments to, I think, Tuesday the 2nd, when ITEC is going to be making a, a full presentation on how ITEC has contributed into the COVID uh, uh, measures. Um, so in terms of uh, some of the issues that have been raised on policy issues, the reimagine industrial strategy and the programs, I think we have indicated that the, the pandemic is having uh, impact on supply chains, disruption on the supply chains, is having impact on the productive sectors. So part of uh, what we need to do in the department is to relook at some of the poly um, sector work that we are doing to make sure that we tweak some of the instruments that we are utilizing to protect and support the industry going forward to ensure that we are as responsive as possible to the challenges that have been posed by the pandemic. But also, as I've indicated in the introduction, uh, how do we leverage of the, the, the opportunities? We have done a lot of work in terms of developing uh, uh, or getting the local suppliers or the local manufacturers ready to produce some of the PPE. Uh, it's work that is progressing and is progressing to our belief to the right direction. Um, uh, we need to continue engaging with, uh, for example, Business for South Africa. We have joined efforts with them to make sure that we coordinate the, the issues of supply and demand in more systematic manner. Uh, we are in a discussion with uh, National Treasury to see how we can utilize the procurement, public procurement levers to ensure that we do support uh, the local manufacturing going forward. Thanks, Chair. Chair, your mic is not on, Chair. Uh, thank you, DDG. Um, okay, thanks, uh, Andre. Um, it may be actually quite important that we actually uh, follow through just to encourage you on the work you reported upon, DDG, because uh, mainly I think it's around the business conform uh, continuity management are uh, issues which are quite important mm -hmm. because we are managing a transition but I think uh, we, we should also look at opportunities in the new environment which we are looking at. Uh, further, I think uh, the accredited conformity assessment bodies, the work you do with them, is actually quite important because those are actually issues that contribute to quality and standard of issues that we may have to look at. Uh, same as the issue of uh, sustainability, value addition and organizational setup. I'm looking at those issues, uh, DG, as a way of comment 
on how we can strengthen the kind of environment we're in. Because uh, working more in detail and looking at those issues can create pillars to ensure that we are actually able to create a space or environment which is more stable. So I think uh, there's a comment uh, we had or the announcement made by uh, Judy in terms of the partnership with the Department of uh, Women, Children and People with Disability. I think those are actually quite important issues because for those who are vulnerable and poor, particularly those who come from rural communities, you would find what we call dignity packs or sanitary pad. It's a point which is actually quite important because uh, even if we do those reusable one, which I think are quite strategic, we might actually find that there might be basic, basic uh, issues relating to what makes the, you know, hygiene uh, quality in terms of availability of water might be things that we end up actually having to look at. Uh, maybe to, to Judy, uh, Edward, uh, Ron, I'm sure you're actually going to do well in terms of the future moving forward with all the contribution you've done. Nduankulu, we would actually like to thank you for the, your contribution. I'm sure if ever there are further issues raised by members, we can actually try and pick up on that uh, secretariat. So I think we should actually maybe pick up on those uh, comments uh, before we check if ever there are any further issues we need to pick up. Secretariat? Chair, there's no further indication of any member wishing to ask any further questions, Chair. Okay. So can I just say um, th there was a point which was actually raised of the ventilators testing. Uh, I think this, uh, it was earlier this morning or uh, yesterday where we had the CEO of Danel. So you might find there may be collaborations which are quite important because Danel was looking at uh, uh, the ventilators and I'm sure the testing part of uh, the presentation we have received from the institutions. So can actually be something that you may look at collaborations or partnerships with some of the departments or entities of government. Uh, so I think the ventilator one was quite interesting and your comment uh, of the part of testing might be a thing which we would encourage that um, we look at the point of how we collaborate and partnership. So I think the final point uh, before we proceed uh, uh, DDG, I'll ask you just to make the closing comments after mine. Uh, one was actually hoping that we can look at the integratability or complementarity of the institution because from the department, if ever you can be able to ensure that we are able to actually ensure that alignment and try and avoid, avoid duplication, you might find that it adds more value and we have more benefit. So, DDG, I'll ask that you actually take uh, your time to uh, conclude your closing remarks. And uh, one, actually, we hope that uh, then we can pick up from that point and uh, welcome all the presentation done by the entities. So, I'm sure I can ask the uh, DDG panel to speak to us in the closing remarks. Thank you, Chair. I was hoping that my colleague, Dr. Chenge, can have an opportunity to say two words, particularly because he is uh, responsible for coordinating the work of the technical infrastructure. We do have a process in the department where we are meeting regularly with the four entities to ensure that we streamline our programs. Uh, I, I, can I just request uh, for your yes. indul uh, indulgence, uh, Chair, just to give yes. him a few minutes just to say a few things. Chenge? That's fine. Uh, th thank you. Um, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, thank you, Honorable, honorable Members. Uh, I, I don't know what I must focus on, but I, I think the point that you raised last, uh, the point to say uh, we should look at um, reducing overlap, uh, I should put it that way, uh, is something that the, the DG has been uh, also talking about. Uh, it's something that we want to address um, 
from the entities first. Uh, so to sit together as entities and see how we can allocate the work better, uh, if I can put it that way, so that we reduce overlap and um, uh, doing the same thing uh, by uh, various entities. So we have set up a, a project uh, with a service provider, our own service provider, uh, TIPS, um, and they are looking at all the mandates uh, so that they can ensure that whatever we do going forward is not going to take away from the important work that is being done. It's all, all actually going to add value. So they are doing the necessary benchmark and they will give us a full report with the recommendations. That then we will, we will discuss that. And once we are ready, uh, we'll go back to the DG uh, and, uh, and let the D DG take the process forward. Thank you. Okay, D DG. Uh, thanks, Chair President, and thank you, uh, uh, Chenge. Uh, I think, Chair, on my side, uh, firstly, to thank uh, the committee for continuous oversight to the entities and guidance on the work that we do. Um, I think being here a couple of times with the entities has really helped us to shape some of the work that we do, uh, both in the department and also in the entities themselves. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, 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 I mean, we are navigating very difficult terrains. I think none of us in the room know how the pandemic is going to pan out, how long it's going to last, uh, and therefore we need to be able to be agile to the responses that we have to provide to the economy and be able to also be responsive to the kind of strategies that we're going to be putting forward, especially as we are talking about post-COVID, because the difficulty is going to be about how do we rebuild the economy going forward. Technical infrastructure institutions have got enormous contribution to make to, to the work of the industrial policy and contributing towards industrial development. And often I believe that the work is not always understood, and I think it's the job that we have to do as the department together with the entities uh, to make the public aware of uh, the kind of service offering, the timing that they need to come to the entities to look for assistance in order to make sure that uh, we are able to be as responsive as possible. Uh, the pandemic itself, as I've indicated, has also bubbled up new opportunities. I think uh, uh, six months ago, nobody thought about making fabric masks, for example. Today, making fabric masks is the most important thing that every, almost every clothing and textiles, uh, every auntie somewhere in the township with the sewing machine is looking for opportunities of actually producing this. So there's uh, enormous opportunities that are also being brought by the, uh, by the pandemic, which I think we should be coordinating a response much more strategically and, 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 and transformatively to ensure that we are able to be as uh, as coordinated and as responsive as possible. Uh, so thank you, Chair, uh, for the guidance. And uh, we we always, uh, it's always a pleasure to be at the committee to share the work we do as the department and our entities. So with, with that conclusion from uh, our DDG, can we actually then um, agree that uh, the uh, department and the uh, technical infrastructure institutions that were before us, uh, mm -hmm. thanking them for this uh, uh, interaction. We, we actually will release you then DDG and the entities. And uh, for the portfolio committee, we will then actually uh, move to the next item on the agenda, mm -hmm. which has to do with the final consideration by the committee uh, of the budget vote report. I think that's the one we're looking at, Secretariat. Uh, that's, correct. Yeah. that's correct, Chairperson. Okay. I'll, um, you have tabled it now before the Committee for Consideration. I'll just ask Margo to put it up and that members can see how we incorporated the inclusions and recommendations into the report. Um, it's now just for members, from, for, for the committee to move the adoption of the agenda, of the report. Sure. Okay, so let's go down to the conclusions. The conclusions, sir. Sure. You you <coughs> will see now after after our engagement on on thir Tuesday, we've incorporated the the conclusions as agreed to by the committee, 
It is exactly as the committee agreed to in principle. Now it is just the formal process that we need to undertake of adopting the report here. Okay. Let me actually then ask the uh, honourable members to say um, uh, from the side of the Secretariat, there wasn't any addition or new issues raised by members between Tuesday and today. So I think uh, one, would, yeah. one just to say the conclusions are the same as we actually con uh, uh, raised them. And can I ask the members of the committee to indicate um, the adoption uh, of the report before us for my consideration. Yes, Secretariat. We have Mr. Mumbuyani's hand raised, Chair. Uh, Honor <coughs> Honorable Mumbuyani. Chairperson, <coughs> thank you very much. I rise uh, for the adoption of this report, Chairperson. Okay, there's a Chair, move have for Mrs. the adoption. Herbins? Can we check that? Is there any other hand? Mrs. Hermans, Chair. Okay. Chair, yes. I wish to second that uh, proposal to adopt the report. Thank you. Let's uh, actually have uh, Herman seconding. Chair, Mr. Mr. Mulder wants to raise a, a, a point, Chair. Okay, uh, Honorable Mulder. Uh, Chair, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Chair, thank you. Um, as indicated in, in the previous meetings, uh, the Freedom Front Plus is current principle, nothing against the report apart from the, the portion in 5.10. Um, so, for that reason, unfortunately, the Freedom from Plus won't be able to, to support the report. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Because we did actually indicate um, uh, uh, Secretariat Chair? In, in, the, in the last meeting uh, on how we capture that. Yes, uh, yes. Thank Chair. you, we'll Honorable Mulder. The, Secretariat? In the minutes. Yes, yes. Uh, Honorable Muller, thank you very much. That's noted. We'll be on the minutes. Can I check if ever there are any further comments on the adopted report before us? So if not, can we actually agree that we proceed with the adoption of the report as a committee with the, those noted points? Because I think uh, in the previous meeting, there were others raised, Secretary. If you can maybe just be uh, able to refer yes, reflect, to that, that it, part, yes. If I may reflect, it was on the same issue that the ACDP and the DA also had the reservations, Chair. So those will be noted in the minutes. For the for the purpose of today's meeting, the, the committee has moved for the adoption in terms of the quorum. And so the report is adopted. We will, in the report, indicate that the Freedom Front Plus has um, um, voted against adoption of the report, Chair. Okay. All right. Can, can we then proceed? I'm sure this is actually uh, the last item on the agenda. Yes. And there, there won't be any administrative issues, Secretariat, that you have or Chair? announcement? Chair, just the announcement is that next Tuesday's meeting will be, we will have ITAC before us. And we will also look at the fourth quarter a uh, non-financial and non-financial report um, um, performance of DTI and EDD. So that is scheduled for next Tuesday, Chairperson. So, so, and then that's the only meeting scheduled for for next week. Chair, also to indicate yeah. that Mr. Madima will be responsible for that particular meeting next week, Chair. He will be hosting that meeting. So all communication with respect to that meeting will come from Mr. Madima. So members must just make sure that Mr. Madima will forward those communications to members. So the agenda will be the presentation by ITEC. That's and correct. GTI and EDG fourth quarter reports. That's correct, Chair. Okay. Can I then actually... Chair. Uh, Chair, Mr. Hermans. Hermans. Chair, I've noticed that um, 
the com committee secretary, Mr. Medima, has uh, network challenges. Will that be resolved? Because it will be, uh, I think it will be very disruptive if the committee secretary is not audible or visible. Okay. Chair, if I may yeah. comment on that, the, Mr. Okay. Madima's issue is being addressed, Chair. The alternative okay. is, like Margot, Chair, she's at Parliament at the moment. Mr. Madima has the same opportunity to be at Parliament, so to resolve that technical issue. So Margot is at Parliament because she has some technical challenges. Mr. Madima has the, has the same opportunity to be at Parliament to resolve those technical challenges, Chair. Um, 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 so. Yeah, I, I thought uh, Hermans will say uh, just on the lighter note, <laughs> we know that there are there are those who are quite far technically we can't hear them properly. Muyane <laughs> did very well today. I was I'm actually quite happy, but I think um, let's actually agree that we are general meeting honourable members and meet next Tuesday, second of June at twelve. That's actually you, our Chair. next meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Chair. Bye. Thank you, Chair. Bye-bye. Thank you, Chair. Bye. Thank you, Chair. Bye.